Tonight on Student News, we focus on the topic this show has been covering for years, teens. Tonight we look at the question how teens are treated by society and government and what the role of teens should be. Tonight we will hear from experts, lawyers, teachers, parents, and as always, teens themselves. It's May 21st, 2012, and Student News starts right now. Good evening, I'm Joshua Wolfson. And I'm Javonna robinson -Hitis. Welcome back to Student News. Ever since the first episode of Student News aired back on February 2nd, 2009, the show has always focused on teens. In designing the show four years ago, it seemed to us that teens weren't taken particularly seriously. We felt and had experienced and had experiences that confirmed that teens were generally marginalized and ignored by the broader community of adults. Thus, it became the mission of Student News to report and examine stories that affected the lives of teens or were about things that teens were doing, things that the majority of news outlets often minimized or ignored altogether. It was that driving force that led this show to bring you stories ranging from teens doing incredible things like climbing mountains, sailing around the world, and standing up for their themselves in their schools, in their schools, communities, and even before their state legislatures. It led us to cover stories about the insane policies that were implemented to control teens and reactionary rhetoric about teens said by schools, politicians, and other adults. And this season, it led us to examine issues of teen sex, intergenerational justice, education, teens and religion, and the achievement gap. It seems only fitting then that in the penultimate episode of the original production team's final season of Student News, we take a closer look at exactly what's been at the heart of all our shows over the past four years. Where do teens currently fit into our society? In our culture, where should teens fit in? In the United States today, the media often portrays teens as out of control and taking part in risky and quite often outrageous behavior. Television shows around, about around Excuse me. Television shows abound about teenage pregnancy and the apparent proliferation of teens engaging in risky behaviors. Following the string of 2010 teen suicides connected to bullying, much of the debate surrounding what to do about bullying revolved around a sometimes implicit but often explicit question of what's wrong with teens today. The teenage years are one of transition as well. At the same time as teens be as teens are being Given greater responsibilities and privileges, such as greater autonomy with families, driving, more homework, and the need to get a job, teens are also constrained by the expectations and restric restrictions of our culture and government put on their actions. This is influenced by perceptions that teens are not rational actors, that they lack self-control, restraint, and are, in many ways, still children. This, in turn, seems to lead to many re to reject or ignore the contributions and ideas of teenagers. Are these perceptions, uh, excuse me, are these perceptions society's view towards teenagers accurate? And if so, is this collective societal view of the teenage years a productive way of treating people? To address these questions and more, student news reporters Isabel Jackson, Zoe Langsdale, Jamin Olmsted, Elizabeth Ortiz, and Shira Zilberstein sat down with experts, teachers, and teens. Take a look. Um, I do think that all adults look upon, like, teenagers as, like, not, obviously not equal to them. Um, just some make it more apparent than others. I used to get that a lot, and I hated it. Um, but I learned to express myself better and sound more mature when I was speaking to adults and be more respectful, and that in turn makes them respect me. I think it does a lot. I mean, you know, people respond to what they see, what is surrounded, what surrounds them. And when you're surrounded by that kind of negative image of teenagers, that's what you start to internalize. But I think the thing that we need to change is the media's portrayal. In addition to there being stupid, reckless teenagers, there are also some really powerful ones that are working to make the world a better place. And if we focus on the mature side of teenagers, which there is, 
um, then I think that will definitely improve the case. But at the same time, I don't understand that. Like, I feel like I can, like, roll with the best of them in terms of conversation mm -hmm. in an area that I know. It's true. There's a lot of stuff that we don't have as good of a understanding as people older than us. Um, it's definitely frustrating when people tell me that, but after, like, without looking past my initial frustration, I kind of understand that you have, there's some stuff you can only understand through, like, experience. So, I mean, it doesn't annoy me as much, just, like, hearing it, but when someone tells me in, like, a situation, or, like, I'm doing something, they're like, like, you'll understand when you're older, like, ugh. Like, I don't think they expect you to act younger. I mean, I think they expect you to act, like, either your age or older. I, I don't I don't know how that makes sense. I mean, they know that that teenagers take risks and that we don't really have very good decision making <laughs> processes. Um, but there is some standards, especially around here, for kids to you know go to the best colleges, be the best kid there is, um, and that's not always really legitimate. There's kind of a, a double standard almost. Um, they expect them to be you know, very responsible, hardworking, go to a great school, um, study to become a, a successful adult. But at the same time, you know, there's that thing like, like in order to be wise when you're older, you have to go crazy when you're young, and they almost expect you, um, you know, to to act stupid and not think things through, and you know, be young and reckless and enjoy life while you're young. But um, I think there's definitely a mixed message that is being sent to teens. If you don't make a good impression, good first impression on like someone who's older than you. I feel like they will always look down upon you and like not have like not expect you to like do certain things. But then again, if you make a good impression, I feel like it's plastered in their mind that like you like want to achieve more and like you are a really hard worker and then they're going to hold you to that expectation. Here, they have a lot higher expectations than what we can physically give them. So I know, I know I'm up really late most nights. Um, I know that most students at the school are too. But then other schools, I feel like they don't push kids enough to be the best they could, the best they could be. Like I've um, shadowed other kids and I just felt like the teachers just condescended kids all the time. I think teachers understand kids a lot better. I mean, that's kind of a key to being a teacher. You spend all your time around high school kids. Um, like, I love just like hanging out and talking to like Mr. Fricka, mm -hmm. like Miss Barbara Chess, because they're, they're just the sweetest, coolest people ever. Um, talk to my parents. I get into arguments a lot because that happens. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm more inclined to take the opinion of my teacher because I feel like they, and they're more willing to listen to me. Um, I think a lot of times it makes them think that they are, you know, frivolous, stupid, not caring about what's going on in the real world around them. You know, as a teen, I have an iPhone. I go on Twitter and Facebook pretty consistently throughout the day, and I know that, um, you know, everyone kind of discounts me just because I do that, which I think is kind of frustrating because, you know, we've seen social media be a really powerful tool in the 21st century. Um, and I think that, you know, people kind of take the wrong message from that. Well, it's technology and it's full of, like, not, like, not confrontation and not face-to-face. -face. And I feel like they, they see that as immature and they see that as childish. So when they, like, hear about, like, Twitter and Facebook and, like, all that stuff, they, all they... I feel like all they think about is just like how you're communicating with someone without like seeing them. And like like that's all I don't know. But um and I think that's like the big the big idea that adults look down upon that stuff on. It's a completely different time. They don't un I feel like older adults don't really understand that because it's just we have completely different resources than they did. And just like work, it's a different way of living. I think about trying to live without technology and trying to live with, and it's just like I couldn't. And I, not that I couldn't, but I just like I cannot imagine. And I feel like 
that is a fault in every like teenager's life. Like the fact that most teenagers just can't even imagine living with that technology. And I and but like that's what that's what the twenty first century is coming to. So I think definitely we depend on it too much, but it's at a point where uh, can't really turn back. Okay, my family, especially okay, my grandma is crazy about this. Anytime I hang out with her, you know, which is like a rare occasion, but you know, if I if she makes a joke or we say something, she, oh, you're gonna Facebook that now, aren't you? Oh, I bet you're gonna Twitter that later, huh? No, okay, no, that's not true. Just because I use a social media site doesn't mean that's everything that my world is. And I think it's really frustrating when adults just assume that and when they kind of link all their social interactions to something that is web-based because that's not how it works. And it's form of expression because there's so many things on the internet and like Facebook and I don't know if you guys like know Tumblr but um, it's really like it's really cool the stuff that people like the websites people make and the some stuff that people post and I think it's cool like seeing all these people doing all these different things and it definitely definitely adds like new like insight and into my life, into everyone's life who looks at that kind of stuff, but and I think like all the generations from now are going to grow up with that stuff, and I think it, the generation older than us, the reason they look down upon us like so quickly is because they didn't have that growing up, but it's just going to continue, and I think it is a good form of expression, although it can be not so good at times. So to an extent, I think that you're you know, I don't think you necessarily grow as much as people think you do just because of your age. Um, you know, I, I think maturity is not necessarily um, based on, like, how old you are. Thanks to Isabel, Zoe, Jamin, Elizabeth, and Shira for getting those interviews. Now, in looking at the role of teens in society, more is at play than social and cultural attitudes. Legal and political realities also have a significant impact on how teens are perceived and, our rights within the, and their rights within the broader society. Under the U.S. Supreme Court's 1987 ruling in Hazelwood v. Kuhlmeyer, schools in the United States are legally able to censor the speech of their students. This ruling's restrictions on the First Amendment, which affects only students in high school, flew directly in the face of a previous Supreme Court decision, Tinker v. Des Moines, in which the court found that students do not, quote, shed their constitutional rights when they enter the schoolhouse door. Following the 1987 free speech restrictions of Hazelwood, the Massachusetts legislature passed the Student Free Expression Act, which, as of 1996, provided the broadest free speech rights to students in the U.S., protecting speech that was even considered vulgar, lewd, and offensive, so long as it didn't disrupt the educational environment. With only a few exceptions in the cases of local elections, teens under the age of 18 in the United States currently do not have a right to vote in elections. Teens under 18 pay $9.7 billion in sales tax every year, according to the National Youth Rights Association, but they do not have the power to vote or run for most elected offices. This fact has led many to argue for the voting age to be lowered. In Minnesota, in, 19, in a 1991 push to lower the voting age to 16, 14-year-old Rebecca Tilson made the following argument before a House subcommittee. She said, quote, If 16-year-olds are old enough to drink the water polluted by the industries that you regulate, if 16-year-olds are old enough to breathe the air ruined by garbage burners that government built, if 16-year-olds are old enough to walk on the streets made unsafe by terrible crime and drug policies, if 16-year-olds are old enough to live in poverty in the richest country in the world, if 16-year-olds are old enough to get sick in a country with the worst public health care programs in the world, and if 16-year-olds are old enough to attend school districts that you underfund, then 16-year-olds are old enough to play a part in making them better. To look further at what teens' current roles are in the political process and what those roles should entail, I sat down with Kathleen Phones, Louisa Levine, and Peter Vickery. Take a look. All right, I am here with Amherst attorney Peter Vickery, Amherst Regional High School sophomore Elizabeth Ortiz, and Amherst Regional High School senior Louisa Levine. Um, so 
Peter, let's start with you, and then we'll just sort of move into discussion. Um, where do you feel like teens are currently in in the political system, um, in in our government? Are their interests being represented, um, and are do they sort of have any any role? And if so, what is that? Well, right now, I don't think they're taking an active enough role. There are some external factors, like the law against 16-year-olds voting, that holds teens back. I think. We don't have teens represented in parliament, uh, in, in state assemblies, <laughs> mainly because we, we don't have a parliament, because this is the United States, as I have to remind myself. No, we don't have teens in state assemblies or in the Massachusetts state legislature, and that could change. I mean, 16-year-olds can vote in many places, in, in Austria, in Germany at state level, um, in parts of Central America, in, not in the UK, but in Guernsey, Jersey, Isle of Man, in parts of Norway. So 16-year-olds have the right to vote, and they have the right to vote, and the right to work, and the right to pay taxes. So I think we should be moving in that direction in the US. I'm not completely sold on the idea of 16-year-olds voting, but I think that we need to examine it a lot more closely. Let's jump into that issue, because um, in the intro segment that I, that I did for this piece, um, there was this great quote by, by Rebecca Tilson, who was a 14-year-old in 1991, and she testified before this Minnesota House subcommittee, and she basically said that um, if 16-year-olds are old enough to endure all of the things that government forces on teens and that, and, and that happens in the world, then they also have a right to have representation and, and try to make them better. Um, but that's not the case right now, and I think a lot of the arguments for that are um, that teens aren't mature enough, that they're not smart enough, that they don't, that they will simply just follow what their parents tell them to. Um, in the voting booth. And so should teens really, should we, what do you guys think, have teens vote? I can really see the argument for having teens vote because, like, as you said, if they're working, then they, I think we have a right to also vote. But I also see the argument that, um, you know, we're too stupid or unaware of world because, I mean, a lot of adult, adults are. And, you know, there are always going to be those people. So I think that giving teens the right to vote after they turn 16 should also apply to the right to vote. Um, I'm not totally sold on giving 16-year-olds the right to vote. I think that when I was 16, I personally don't think that I had the, I didn't have the kind of knowledge I have today. I wasn't really invested in getting to know the politicians that I was voting for. Um, I mean, maybe that has to do with age, maybe that has to do with the kind of classes I've taken in high school. I mean, definitely, like, taking international relations um, this year has really helped me try to figure out what I'm really voting for, what I want in a president or, you know, whoever else. Um, but I think that a lot of times, like, as a 16-year-old, I was definitely more influenced by my peers and my parents than I was by my own common sense or my own knowledge of the political world. Um, I think there's, so, on the other side of that, though, because I, I am in favor of, of lowering the voting age um, to 16, and I think on the other side of that is that there are many, many people, um, and youth rights advocates make this argument all the time, there are many people who enter the voting booth who have really no good knowledge whatsoever um, about uh, the governmental system. They don't know anything about international relations. Um, and yet, when you hit the age of 18, this arbitrary number, this arbitrary age, you suddenly are bestowed with this right to participate in government. Um, so it's not, I mean, the criteria that we use for letting people vote is not about intelligence really, or about knowledge of the political system. It's, it's really just about age, and I'm, I, it, it doesn't make sense to me why that is. Well, why should we, why should we really lower the voting age to 16 of all numbers? Why not 17? Why not 15? Well, I can think of one good reason, and that's to encourage people to vote. And one of my reasons for not being completely sold on the idea is that I think we're in danger of elevating the importance of voting. And voting, as Howard Zinn liked to say, is, is harmless. It has some marginal usefulness, but it's no substitute for democracy. And that requires an involved and active citizenry. Voting isn't the be-all and end-all of active citizenship. And I think if we focus uh, too much on the right to vote, we lose sight of the fact that there's a lot more to being an active citizen than voting. On the other hand, 
if we want people to vote when they're 18, in the 18 to 24 segment, that demographic is the lowest voter turnout block. So if all the people who vote regularly in the United States, that's a very small number. But the lowest turnout is among 18 to 24 year olds. And if we want to fix that, one way is to get people voting sooner. So if people vote when they're 18, statistics suggest that they're going to carry on voting in every election after that. If you get people to vote when they're if they vote when they're 18, they're going to carry on voting. If they vote when they're 16, you know, maybe that'll be even better. So I think there's, there's a, a very strong argument in favor of lowering the voting age to 16 because it, the sooner you start voting, the more likely you are to continue voting at the same time. I don't want people to think that voting is uh, the be-all and end-all of active citizenship. I think if we were to lower the voting age, politicians would really have to step up and really try to get through to teens or really campaign hard, get their issues out there, like get their politics known and stuff like that, which they're not, I mean, I'm not getting very much of that because I, as a teenager, don't like read the New York Times every morning. I don't go through all these news sites all the time, you know. I get news as basically other people tell me as my Facebook news feed tells me, so. Um, I think one of, the, one of the things about that though, and this is the important part about having teens have, have the right to vote is that right now, I. I feel like there's a clamping down in the political sphere, or, or there has been continually over time a clamped down nature in the political sphere on teens, on their ability to have their interests heard. And so insofar as um, you don't pay attention to politicians so much and, and their issues, they're also not paying attention to your issues. Mm -hmm. um, and so I mean that, that can be combated with giving teens voting rights and it can also be combated with expanding free speech rights, which is also something that we've seen diminish over over the last few years. Well, when I think about your speech rights, I think less about profanity and more about your ability to discuss intelligently issues like many of you aren't going to get jobs, many of you aren't, aren't going to go to college or emerge from college without crippling debt. And uh, that's something I might want to talk about if I was 16, 17, 18. What are my chances of leaving high school, not going to prison, because if I'm African American, my chances of making it through the rest of my life without going to prison are much lower than if I'm white. So one in three African-American men in their 20s is at some point of the criminal justice system, either in jail, on parole, or under some form of criminal justice supervision. So if I'm black and I'm 16, I want to talk about that. I want a space to talk about that in school. If I'm going to college, I want to be able to talk about how I'm going to be able to afford it. And when I get out, what are the chances of actually getting a job that enables me to pay back that debt? So I think those are things worth talking about and having a space where you can talk about them without some buzzer going off telling you you've got to scuttle off to lunch or you've got to run away in some infantilized way to your, your math lesson. So having a space to talk about things that really matter intelligently, I think that's what uh, free speech is about, not whether you can use four-letter words and, and be mean to other students. I mean, just some things you shouldn't do. It's a question of politeness. Uh, but the more important issue is, are you going to discuss matters of great import and do so in an intelligent, informed, productive way? I think. All of this plays to the, the larger issue, which I think is that we have, at least up until you're, you know, let's say 30, mid 30s, let's say, um, society, especially in the United States, but across the world, age becomes an incredibly important factor in um, who you are and how society views you. Um, from the point at which you enter elementary, enter elementary school, right, the most important thing about you is what grade you're in. Not what your interests are, not who you are as a person, not whether you like you know, peas or broccoli. It's about what grade you're in. And so we've categorized people according to age. And I think, for me, what I'm finding is that more and more, um, age is not a good descriptor of, of whether people are mature enough to be put in prison for years and years and years. To put a 21-year-old in prison for life, opposed, if, if he does something opposed to when he's 18, I think is not it's not a huge gap. And so to simply just draw that line in the sand at one age, at one arbitrary age, I think is, um, I, I think we ha we're, we're vastly misguided about how we approach um, maturity, about how we approach intelligence, and about how we approach um, when one can actually take responsibility for one's own actions. I think you're, you're onto something. I think it, at least we know the wrong way to go about this is. There are, there are good ways to find out when you're mature enough to, uh, to be able to drink alcohol or to drive a motor vehicle on a regular basis. Um, 
you know, what the start time for school should be. There are ways to really drill down into this and come up with you know, empirical data. But we know that an arbitrary line at, say, 21, which is based on the age at which a young man could wear a full suit of armor, is not necessarily the best reason for making that the legal drinking age. You know, being able to wear a full suit of armor and being... That's a whole other episode. It's a whole <laughs> other <laughs> But at least we're at the point where you know what's not the right basis for making a decision. So at least we're, we're sort of clawing our way towards finding the right basis for making a decision. And I think we'll be clawing our way there for years. Um, that's it for this segment. Um, thanks to Peter Vickery, Elizabeth Ortiz, and Louise Levine for sitting down with me. Back to the studio. I think if there is anything that tonight's episode and our last four years of reporting have shown, it is that youth can do great things. Youth can do incredible things. Youth can come together and discuss politics, economics, sex, media and technology, bullying, sexuality, religion, and education at the highest levels. Youth can organize and volunteer and help to build communities. Youth can have ideas about how to change the world. Youth can have the potential to rise and meet these challenges, and many youth, as we have shown, do. Yet the laws and the culture of the United States, and indeed the world, is not at all conducive to promoting those feelings of empowerment, of duty, of inclusion, of confidence, competence, and of value in teens. Over the last season, we have all come together and talked about the numerous issues that are plaguing the world today, and we want to fix them. But because of the lack of rights, because of the culture of disempowerment, because of the sentiment that children should be seen but not heard, it makes it all that much harder for teens who do want to help to be able to. It is the position of this anchor and this show that it is time that the teen perspective is recognized, respected, empowered, and valued by American society to be as valid as the perspective of any other group. Because, simply, it is. And that's it for us tonight. If you would like to learn more about the show, how to get involved, or how to donate money, please visit our website at www.riverwolfproductions.org slash studentnews. Until next time, I'm Giovanna robinson Haidas. And I'm Joshua Wolfson. Stay strong and stay proud. We'll see you next month for our season finale. Have a good night. Thank you.